Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our first Autism and Neurodiversity Workplace Masterclass. Uh, we're going to get going in just one minute. Uh, my name's Ben from Autism and Neurodiversity Coaching. We've also got John O'Kane, former professional footballer, uh, played for Manchester United in the 90s. I'm um, just going to give it another minute or so just to let people settle in and then we'll get started. <clears throat> right everyone let's get going um so i'm going to explain a little bit about the the master classes in a second um so thanks everyone for coming um appreciate your being here this is the very first one we're doing we've got some more throughout the week so we're here monday to sunday and um, there'll be between half an hour to an hour a day um roughly um so we're going to get going. So can we get the next slide, please? Thank you. So um, we will be putting this on YouTube for anyone that can't access the Facebook group. Um, so just so you're aware of that. You can use the chat on Facebook Live. If you want to put any comments in there, if you want to say hello, if you want to say where you're from. Um, what you sort of do work-wise as well, what you're sort of interested in, in, in this is. Uh, next slide, please. <coughs> so I'm just gonna, uh, I'm gonna introduce John in a second. Uh, I'm just gonna turn my camera off just cause the internet sometimes can be a bit funny. So I'm just gonna turn that off. So first off, who are autism and your, di di can't really speak now. Who are autism and your diversity coaching? So our team uh, contains neurodiversity employees, it was founded by myself, Ben Holmes. Um, I'm a qualified autism practitioner. I'm also autistic as well. I've got a million other conditions. I won't bore you with every single one of them. Um, but I've got ADHD, dyspraxia, OCD, anxiety, and a bit of depression thrown in there for good measure as well. Uh, next slide, please. So just about what we do, what sort of services we offer. So we provide coaching for neurodiverse individuals, um, training for businesses of all sizes as well. So that includes mentoring for staff and management, um, awareness sessions or coaching sessions for family, um, friends of a neurodiverse individual, if someone's autistic, they've got ADHD, um, even if they've got mental health conditions like OCD, anxiety as well. Um, lots of lots of neurodiversity related stuff. Um, so I like to get involved in different projects, neurodiversity related. Um, now we main, mainly operate operate online. Um, it's just so we can support as many businesses and individuals as we can. Um, obviously can't be in a million places at once. Uh, next slide please. So I hand over to John for to introduce himself. Um, we've got information on the screen there as well. All right, guys. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to this. Um, ben contacted me a few months ago and uh, discussed what what we want to do. Um, I'm looking forward to um, doing some masterclasses on this. Really, like I say, I'm I'm learning myself. Um, and Ben, Ben's um, qualified to <laughs> to help me through this. To be fair, he, I'm sort of getting a bit of uh, therapeutic help on this as well. To be honest, but uh, yeah, I can draw back on some of my experiences, of what I went through um, in the in the sporting arena uh, and even in the real world as well, and how I sort of masked it. I sort of covered up what I what I was going through, uh, which obviously isn't great. Um, but yeah, so. Hopefully, with these um, with these sessions, we can, um, we can we can do some good. Uh, so yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Cheers, John. Um, so just you can see the information on the screen there as well, just in terms of <coughs> you know, what John has done uh, in the game of football. 
<clears throat> played with some of the you know the biggest legends uh, Manchester United have ever had. Uh, you can see some of the names on the screen there. You know, Eric Cantona, Roy Keane, etc. All the class of '92. Um, also played in some some memorable matches in the '90s. Uh, I believe the Villa one, the infamous. Was it that one you played in the three 0 Did you play in that one? Three uh, one, yeah. Three one. Sorry, uh, my bad. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Late goal. I think. Anderson, yeah, Alan's made a comment that he can't win nothing with kids, so sort of kind of quite a famous quote then, but yeah. Yeah. Um, right. Uh, next slide. We'll, we'll learn more from John as we go along. So I'm just going to go through um, some, you know, training. John will put his input in there as well. Um, so why we're here? Why you're here on this call right now? Um, so hopefully to learn more about autism or a lot about autism, depending on what you're coming. Uh, knowledge level is also neurodiversity and mental health um, how it affects people with various conditions um, now if you learn more about the above um, if you're representing a business this will help you to support um, any neurodiverse employees you may have you might have em employees in neurodiverse and not even know about it um, and also those mental health issues anxiety depression OCD etc and now by doing that, um, it will help you to improve your employee well-being. So if your staff are happier uh, because they've been supported more, that will then have a knock-on effect, um, which will increase their productivity. So basically, you know, if you've got happier staff, they're being supported, you know, they feel like they're being part of something, there's, there's a high chance of them actually working better. Now if they do that, then that will help you boost your income. So you know, you've got staff who are happy, they're working hard, it's gonna have a knock on effect uh, for your income as a business as well. Um, next slide please. And then a few other benefits as well. So you may have neurodiverse customers, so say if you're a, a sports coach, um, you know some of the, the kids or adults you, you coach or manage, um, they may, may have dyslexia for example, um, you know, they may have hidden um, struggles that you're not aware of as well. Now, if you're supporting them, then that will have a knock-on effect. So your customers or your clients, whatever, you, whatever you've got, they'll be more happy to work with you, to speak to you. Um, you know, if you're a coach, like I say, they want to come to training more if you understand a bit more about them and what sort of they're going through, whether it's struggles or identifying the strengths as well. So by doing that, there's a knock on effect of, of that. So um, depending on, again, what indus what sort of role you're doing, so if you're coaching, they're more likely to want to sort of play for you or, or with you. Um, you know, if you've got customers, if you're sort of in any sort of selling um, role, they're more likely to sort of buy from you. Um, and then again, the same as the other, yeah, there's another knock-on effect which will help you boost your income or your performance you know your end goal or result whatever that is uh, next slide please <coughs> i'm going to try and get out of saying next slide please because it wastes a few seconds so i might just say next slide in the future but we'll see how it goes um right so how it works and so what we'll be covering um it's so like i say we're here monday to sunday and don't forget if you can't catch us live um, it will be in the group. We'll also get it on YouTube at some point as well. Um, if you can't access it for some reason, please contact us. Um, you can always pop us a message, whether it's email or in the, um, the chat. So today we're going to be looking at what is autism, what is neurodiversity, and then the strengths and struggles of autistic employees within sport. Um, also uh, includes your customers as well or, or clients. Tomorrow we'll be looking at the recruitment process and hiring autistic staff in the sports industry. Then on to Wednesday, we'll be looking at other neurodiverse conditions, so the likes of ADHD, dyspraxia, dyslexia. Again, the strengths and struggles um, of these neurodiverse employees, so they might not be autistic, might have these other things instead, or be these other things. And then again, the recruitment process of hiring and retaining them. Uh, Thursday, uh, what is mental health, how this affects your employees or customers, 
a bit of a recap of the last four days. Then on to Friday. Also, I missed that bit out. I missed that bit out. So, as I said earlier, going along, John will include some of his personal experiences um, that he's had playing pre professional football. Um, it might not include just for Manchester United, some of the, the other clubs he's played for as well. Um, for example, Everton, Blackpool. Um, then we're on to Friday, um, where we'll be inter doing some interviews, um, explaining what else we've got coming up as well. And that'll be Friday through to Sunday. So Friday, Saturday and Sunday will be the same sort of format. Uh, next slide, please. I said please, I didn't mean to. Right, so <clears throat> just a bit of information um, just to put things into perspective. So, you know, how much does it cost to hire a new employee? Uh, and you'll see why this is relevant later on. So, you know, if you do some research on this, you get different answers back. Um, so, you know, depending on what size your business is will, will depend on the cost, and what sort of sector you're in, etc. Um, now in the UK, this can cost on average £3,000 to recruit. Training can be over a grand, uh, and there's numerous other costs as well. But like I say, that, that can can be much higher than that in some businesses. Um, but if you want to put in the chat, um, you know, if you, you know, if you know what sort of figures are for your particular company, feel free to put them in the chat uh, as well. In terms of how much does it cost to replace an employee, um, in the UK, the average cost of employee turnover um, based on the average salary is around 11 grand a person. Again, those figures can range. <coughs> um, I mean, some if you look on some websites, they'll say it costs over 30,000 to replace a staff member. Um, and others say that replacing an employee can range from one and a half uh, to two times the employee's annual salary. So again, these figures range, but the point is it all costs money. Uh, next slide. Oh, next bit, sorry, my bad. Um, and as I said, some figures are even higher. So basically the point of all this, why, why are we saying this? Um, is it not worth retaining good employees? So if you've got good employees there, they just need a bit of support, um, a bit of understanding, a bit of acceptance then surely you want to keep hold of them. Um, now, there will be autistic employees included in that. Um, well, I know for a fact there is. Uh, I've dealt with it sort of first hand, so I know, I know this. Um, so, yeah, basically supporting. Uh, next slide. So, just a few facts on autism and the workplace. Uh, again, these figures will vary slightly depending on where you look, but give or take one or two percent. And there's only around 22 percent of autistic people in paid work. Again, like I say, some variation that depending on your source. Uh, in terms of full-time work, um, six between sort of 14 and 16 percent. Um, which, if you think about, it, is quite shocking numbers. To be fair, you think only sort of 14, 15, 16 percent are in full-time work. Now the thing is with that is many autistic people want to be in full-time work. That's the thing, it's not like they don't want to be. I'm not I'm not speaking for every autistic person. Some won't want to be in work. But some won't want to be in work because of how they've been um, sort of treated in the past, not because they don't want to actually work. And that's a big difference as well. Many recruiters do refuse to employ autistic people. That's even, that might not, not be even intentional. Um, they might refuse them because of you know something to do in the interview which I get on to later which is down to them being autistic or having an anxiety but the employer doesn't realize that because they don't understand um, the person so yeah many autistic people are missing out basically and so are the recruiters yourselves because you're missing out on some good in, good employees out there most employee uh, so employers don't provide the right environment Obviously, there are some that do uh, provide the right environment. Um, and I'm not saying everyone is a bad employer because that's absolutely not right. Um, but basically, in terms of applying for the jobs, doing the interviews, you know, a lot of people are missing out of that. You know, that you know they're not getting past that bit because uh, various challenges and things not being set up right for them. 
And then I, if they can actually make it into the job, it can be even harder. Uh, next slide, please. Was there anything you want to add with that, John, before I carry on? You, you okay? I think you, you muted. No, that's fine, mate. Carry on. Okay. Um, so now on to what is autism. Um, now, if you ask an autistic person, you might get a range of different answers. If you ask an autistic parent, you get a range of different answers. So um, you're fully aware of that and what I'm saying here. I'm not saying this is gospel. It's just how we look at it. Um, you know, there's, there's reasons for that as well. So <clears throat> the first one is autism a disability. And um, again, if you ask some autistic people, they will say yes, and they've every right to say that. Um, the reason I believe in this, that it, in terms of it not being a disability, is I think it's more your environment and the people around you that don't support you properly that make it a disability. And I think also with that. A lot of autist people can have a disability as well, and that can get confused with it. Like if you had a, a mental health condition as well. Um, that's, there are still a lot of people out there that believe autism is a disease that needs to be cured. Um, <clears throat> yeah, that's a lot of autist people are passionate about that. Um, you know, it's it's not a nice thing to say, to be honest with you, saying you've got a disease. Or you are a disease, should I say? Uh, mental health condition, like I say, a lot of autistic people have anxiety disorders, which mental health conditions which go alongside that. So I can see why people may confuse the two. Um, <clears throat> a learning difficulty or disability, again, you might have a co-occurring condition to go with autism, which then may lead to people thinking that autism is a disability. And like I say, if you are autistic and you think it is a disability, absolutely fine. That's you get every right to sort of think that. Disorder, now technically it is called autism spectrum disorder, so therefore it would say it's a disorder. However, I do believe in time that word will re be removed officially. It might take a few years, but I think that will go. Um, you know, it's saying autism is a disorder, so it's it's not right, it's out of sync, it's not, not good. Uh, then the last one, you know, lack of intelligence, retardation, you know, it's Again, some autistic people do have a learning disability, which may lead people to think that. Uh, next slide. <coughs> so different names for autism. Um, again, you ask an autist person or someone to do with autism, they'll have different answers, and that's fine. If you look at the bottom here, the very bottom bit, personal preference, um, you know, each autist person has the right to refer to themselves whichever way they want. Um, so basically, if you're autistic, in my opinion, you should choose how you present yourself. So, I've said about disorder, and um, the reason, a few reasons I don't like disorder. Um, <clears throat> just very quickly on Asperger's syndrome, you will have heard a lot of people refer to themselves as having that. Um, now, all that's, I'll explain the reason behind that. So, Hans Asperger um, was part of the Nazi or Nazi, I never know which way around to say it, Nazi regime. And there's a lot of research there saying that he sent autistic people to the deaths, basically, um, and then were called after him, which I think is a bit wrong, to be honest. Um, however, on that, a lot of autistic people will refer to themselves as having Asperger's. One of the reasons will be because they were diagnosed as having that, which is absolutely fine. You know, I can see why that would be. It's like, well, I've been told I've got Asperger's, so that's what I'm going to stick to. If that's the case, again, it's personal preference. So I don't want to start a debate or anything like that. It's just this is how I refer to it. That's just me and my company. It doesn't mean everyone has to do that. Now, the high and low functioning, um, you've possibly have heard of this. Um, again, some us people, autistic people don't mind it. Uh, they prefer to be referred to that way, and that's their choice. Absolutely fine. Um, the reason I don't like high functioning is because it can belittle some of the struggles you go through. For example, someone may say, if, if you say oh, I'm struggling with X, Y, or Z, and they say, yeah, but you're high function though, so you can't be that bad. And it sort of belittles your struggles. On the other end of it, if someone says you're low functioning, you can get labelled with that for the rest of your life in the sense of, well, oh, I can't do anything. Uh, everyone says I'm low function, so I can't, I can't get a job. I can't do things myself. When in fact, some supposedly low function people can do more than high functioning in some ways. So... 
I prefer the word autism. It just covers, it's just one word, it just, yeah. Um, in terms of autism spectrum to condition, a lot of people don't like the word condition. I don't, I'm sort of 50 50 on it to be honest. But again, it's all personal preference there. Right, we'll move on from that one. Next slide. So, a bit on the autism history and prevalence. I don't really like that word prevalence, but that's the word we use. So, I'm not going to bore you with, with too much, I'll give you too much in depth on that. Um, so, the word autism comes from the Greek word autos, autos, I can't say it right, which means self. It has been around for as long as other humans have. Some of the most famous people throughout history have been autistic. Um, but it's very new in terms of people understanding it. There's still a lot of people who don't. Um, it'll be some years before it, was, it is properly understood and accepted. Autism people are born autistic or die autistic. Um, you can't catch it. Um, you know, can't catch it through COVID somehow or anything like that. Um, in terms of prevalence, perhaps I'm going to make a joke about that, probably shouldn't, so move on. Um, prevalence rates are different, different countries. I believe that's just down to different diagnostic um, criteria. Every country is different how they deal with that process. Some people are getting diagnosed quicker in certain countries. Uh, and in the UK, um, again, depending on your speed, I, I say it's between 1% and 2% of the current figures. It used to be 700,000 uh, a couple of years ago uh, in the UK. In the USA, it's over 2%. Some say it's 1 in 44, some say 1 in 58, 57, depends on your source. Uh, next slide. Autism myths. Um, you may have heard some of these. Some people say we're all autistic, and we're not. You may have the some um, what's the word similarities. Um, you know, you both might you and a non-autistic person might like to have routine, for example. Doesn't mean you're autistic. Um, you can't just have a little bit of it. Um, believe it or not. Um, Again, I've just answered that bit there. I've jumped ahead. Um, autistic people do not have a special talent. Um, many do, um, but not everyone does. That's important to men to, to know. It's not covered by vaccines. Um, I still can't believe that whole thing. It confuses me a bit, but there we go. Um, it's not a childhood condition. Um, and it cannot and should not be cured. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> Sorry, John, is there anything you want to bring up at the moment? No, I'm just listening. It's okay. fine. Cool. So, gives me a chance for a drink as well, then you see. Okay. Right, characteristics of autism. <clears throat> um, now, these are just some things that autistic people may be or have. Doesn't mean everyone is the same, because not all the same. Um, so, restrictive and repetitive behaviours and movements. Um, a lack in social skills and social interaction. That doesn't mean every autistic people can't socialise because that's not not the case at all. Uh, limited interests and diet, um, and general, generally inflexible in terms of like thinking and timings, things like that. A dislike for change or dis disruption to routines. Um, that's a big one. And um, difficulties with eye contact, or they may display unusual eye contact, like stare. It's too much. Apparently, um, whatever the right sort of amount is there. Um, extremely passionate about specific topics or objects. Uh, next slide. <coughs> <coughs> so, they may appear different um, or weird, unusual, or have supposedly unusual interests. They might be interested in, um, I don't know. The presidents of Uruguay, for example. But then again, you know, what makes that unusual? Just because not everyone else likes that. Um, honesty, they may be really honest and use logic. Um, I personally don't really see what the problem is with that one, but there we go. It's got me into trouble in the past. Um, I'm sure it has done with John as well. Um, you know, rituals and patterns of behaviour. Uh, they may have sensory difficulties, sort of light, you know, lights being too bright, sounds, 
<clears throat> too much for him. You know, background music, smells, might be smells of food. Aftershave is, it's not for me, but aftershave is a big one for a lot of autist people. Um, which can then um, have a knock on effect for other autist people. Because if, you know, you may, you may get one autist person who wants to wear aftershave, obsessed with wants to wear it, and another one hates the smell of it. So if you put them together, then we probably argue over that. Um, which shows that we're all different as well. Executive functioning difficulties, so getting distracted, I did a bit there to be fair. Um, blocking out other events can be hard as well. Um, they can be well above average with some things, but well below average with others. Um, you know, a few yeah. colleagues I've got referred to it as a spiky profile, so it's very up and down. So you could be, you know, on, you know, you can get one or two person who's, I don't want to say it's a bit of a stereotype, but you know, amazing at maths. I'm not, for example, but sort of amazing at maths or science, something like that, but then the social skills are really bad. Or you can have someone who's, I don't know, an exceptional footballer, but then they may not, um, may not be able to cook, for example, um, or do anything like that. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> so autistic strengths within sport. Um, so these are just some of the things I can bring to the table. Um, Attention to detail, um, sort of spotting patterns of play, um, scout opponents. So you could have a football scout um, who's autistic. They may be able to spot little sort of things which may help. Uh, preferring routines, um, again, not everyone's like that. Um, but if if they are, that uh, brings consistency in organisation. So if you train at the same time every day, for example, obviously if you don't then. That could throw it off, but if you did, for example, I could be there on the spot every day, potentially. Exceptional memory for facts, numbers, or events. So, if you've got a data analyst, um, you might have someone working on football manager or something like that, um, could be good. Um, being different, so they may possess different skills. Um, it's believed Lionel Messi is autistic, um, there's a lot of information about that. Um, and I can see why. Um, honesty, so that before more clear in communication, which I don't know if I'll bring John in in a second if he wants to say anything about that. Um, sort of being honest. Yeah, like I say, I discussed it before we have um obviously not you guys, but uh, yeah, I was probably too honest. It's probably, I didn't even realise when I was playing that I'd always want to question, question uh, managers all the time, especially if I felt like they were wrong. I couldn't bite my lip, sort of thing. And I had to, you know, I had to say something. Just something in me that I thought that I had to say something. That I didn't think it was right, you know. Obviously, a lot of the players that um, that wouldn't speak up, but I'd be the one that that was <laughs> that wouldn't be scared to speak up, and that sort of damaged me in in a way sometimes with managers. So, some managers like that, but um, I would I would want to like discuss it even further. Just just probably just inquisitive, just. I want to know why, you know, I didn't understand at the time why I was always I was always the one that wanted to know, you know, um, what was going on, what, why why are you saying that, you know, just something I don't know, maybe the coach was saying something like literal, and I just took it I don't know the wrong way, I don't know, but uh, just something in me just felt like I had to say something, and just like I say, I've always been too honest, I'd say sometimes you need to, you know, bite, you know, pick your battle or something, but I, I just went for that was it, you know. There was no filter. Uh, some managers liked, but a lot of managers in, in, in business at the end of the day, you know, sometimes you've got to be kiss ass, you know. And I, I just wasn't. I just wanted to just just make something clear in my own mind, you know. Think, why, why are you saying that? Why, why are you, why are you sort of not picking on me? Because I can take that, but why, you know, just why? And so, but only over the years now, I've matured. I sort of realised that. Sometimes I just need to shut up, but <laughs> but there's just something in me that just made me want to question stuff. So yeah, all throughout my career. Yeah, I can resonate with that. Um, totally appreciate that. <coughs> so why are we doing this? Oh, because we've been told to. All oh, right, okay, fair enough. We'll, we'll do that, and just because we've been told to, we'll, we'll do that. Actually. <laughs> but um, but yeah, um, creativity, um, sort of new. They can bring new coaching ideas if a coach or a player, you know, for example, you know, a new set piece. If you if taking 
corner of Owen and something like that that may come up with different ideas uh, as a player or as a coach um, or manager. Um, Utilising new skills, they may have different skills to others. <coughs> um, finding different ways to win as well. Um, it's also believed, again, just sort of people saying this, whether he's or not, I don't know, but Bielsa, Leeds manager, some say he's autistic, um, you know, how he sort of prowls he's down definitely, to well. He's definitely on the spectrum, isn't he? I, I watch Looks him, like, yeah. and I, I no, no, I'm friends who watch football, no, no one's sort of said anything, but you look at him, you think, there's something not right, I'll say something not right, but he's definitely, uh, he's out there, you know, just the way, have you noticed, he, he never looks to anybody in the eye. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, that's never look, yeah. Eye contact in the uh, always looks down, doesn't he? Um, he has this like ritual where he just sort of bends on his knees, yeah, um, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the sideline. Who does that, you know? But it, it, um, no, no one even in the co coms or the commentary has ever mentioned anything that, do you know what I mean? Which, which is fair enough, you know, but um, yeah, I'd say he's definitely on the spectrum, yeah. It's yeah, it's been <clears throat> commented on the. I see a few sort of online things I've seen. Um, All right. But yeah, it's like I say, I don't think he's come out and said it, but there's speculation there. Yeah. So it. it I've, never, I've never seen him look into the camera. Like, <coughs> no. Like being interviewed, he's, he just looks down, doesn't he? And that's a classic trait, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, yeah, maybe it will come out that he is, which would be great if, if so. But yeah. Um. Intense focus on a favourite activity. Um, you know, high concentration and less likely to become be labelled lazy or sort of switch off if it's something you're really you know passionate about. And um, just before, before we move on, John, is there anything you want to add on any of these bits here? Um, the me the messy one's interesting. I'm yeah. not sure that he'll come out and say anything, but I've not seen anything any traits. What you know, the way he, the way he is, it's just, he just you see, it just seems quite. Um, introverted, I suppose. He's not. He's not very. Um, he's not like Ronaldo, obviously. He's just, he's a pro opposite. He, you know the way he puts himself about. But I don't know. I don't know if he's autistic or not. But that'd be interesting to see if he is. But um, no, can move on. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, oh, we skip one here or not? Can you just go back up a minute? I think. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so punctuality, reliability. So they may arrive on training at time, uh, on time. Big picture thinkers. Um, they may visualise. Um, you know, sort of. They may see how they can achieve more potentially, whereas others can't potentially. Um, loyalty. Um, they may stay with a team or coach uh, for a long period of time if they've been sort of trek right basically. Um, a fondness for rules, um, they may, may be, keyword may be, um, unless they've got other conditions or other elements as well, they may be less likely to get red carded or not breaking rules, but um, there's also a caveat that, that if the rules are illogical, then that can throw things out as well. If it doesn't make sense, then, you know, if there's a rule there and it makes complete sense, then they're more likely to do it. Um, not influenced by the majority. Um, if the manager, for example, they may pick the best players rather than the most popular team. Um, and less emotional at times. Keyword is at times. Um, they may be able to think clearer during an important game or match or when you're in sort of crisis. Sometimes they can think more clearer. Um, it can go the complete opposite where they just have a full on. You know, meltdown or rage or whatever it is. Um, it's just two sort of sides to that. Is there anything you want to add to that that bit? You mean? Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, definitely not influenced by a majority. Um, there's something again, something in me that I've never followed the crowd. I've always, I've always been sort of strong-minded in my own sort of um, thoughts and um, opinions. And again. That, that can um, make you sort of stick out as well. Um, not intentionally, I suppose, when I was playing, but I, always, I say I always felt that um, no one could have influenced me at all. Um, but obviously, I take on, you know, on instructions from um, certain people, but 
Um, I, could, I could never be swayed through um, what other people want to do. I'd make my own mind up sort of thing. You know, that's quite, I think that's a good trait to have, I think. Um, yeah, the um, punctuality is a big thing as well. Timing-wise, I told you before, I have to be on time no matter what, you know. Um, something in me that just, I'm never late. I hate people, I, not hate, but I can't stand when people make, make that I'm waiting for them, you know. Um, one, it's rude, but um, it's just, punctuality is a massive thing with me for some reason. I never understood it really, but it's like, it's a big thing in my sort of life, like especially with three kids, I'm quite regimented in um, in time, and when they're not on time, I'm, I'm, I'm on them. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's, I'm just being, uh, say, uh, reliable, you know, and thinking of others, you know what I mean? It's, I don't want people waiting for me, so, you know, uh, yeah, punctuality is just something is big on my sort of radar that I'm always on time. Yeah, that <clears throat> that's a big one. Um, see if anyone remembers when we covered the ADHD bit later on, because um, that can have a contradictory bit there. Because um, I'm a bit of both. I'm very much like you in one sense, but then the ADHD mm -hmm. wants to do the other, um, which is a nightmare. But yeah, there are, I know there are a lot of autistic people out there where they'll take it to that <coughs> extreme in some people's opinion where like if it's literally on the dot, if someone's not ready for the dot, they'll say, right, I'm going, I'm going out the door now. You said you'd be ready for 10, yeah. it's 10 o'clock, I'm going. <laughs> so, yeah. Um... I remember Roy Keane saying something, I don't know if you've seen um, any interviews with Roy Keane. Yes. I think he, he yeah. was supposed to be taking someone to training or something, or, or, or yeah. to, I think it might be Michael Richards, um, to, um, to the studio or something, or it might be in a hotel waiting for someone. And they were late, and he, he just he just went, he just buggered off. I always thought yeah. him, especially Cantona as well, they've both got that trace of sort of, I'll say genius, but that sort of like, they're not willing to like uh, budge on anything. It's like, it's it's my way or the highway sort of thing. You just, if, if you're not on time with, with what they're doing, it's like, F you, I'm, I'm gone. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I always felt, I was quite close to Roy Keane as well. Yeah. And we sort of, sort of clicked in how we thought. Even though we were polar opposites in like um, the way we thought about football, because he was like all or nothing, weren't he? Yeah. I was quite laid back in that way. I was off that way. But in terms of like getting on and thinking like about you know things, we did get on. Um, but yeah, I always thought there's something in him that, that time-wise and structure that he, he sort of goes by. Yeah. Yeah, I can. <clears throat> I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of Keane. I can see. I can see where you're coming from with that. Yeah, a lot of similarities in that sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, right, where are we? Uh, duh, 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 duh. Right, is there anything else you want to add on this bit before we move on? Uh, no. Uh, next slide, please. <coughs> so now, so we've done some of the um, strengths, we're going to look at some of the struggles, or you know, if you want to change that word, however you want to word it, um, issues, whatever. Um, now, socialising, I don't know if you want to give you your view on this, John, because obviously you, you're a bit, I think you did better with the socialising than what some autistic mm -hmm. people would do. Um, yeah. I'd say so, socialising, you know, back in the 90s, yeah, I, I'd go out, be fine. But uh, um, team bonding, yeah, I was always fine. In, in my own little circle sort of thing, I, I was never like, um, I was popular amongst the teammates. I'd never be the one that sort of like, that would be in the middle, like, you know, telling jokes or that kind of stuff. I'd sort of sit back and I'd, I'd, I'd be watching people, you know, I'm analysing and I'm taking everything in sort of thing. So I never, I never wondered why why I did that. But yeah, I'd, I'd always be, I'm a people watcher. I do like to sort of sit back yeah. and let other people sort of make fool themselves. But yeah, I'd just sort of, I'd step back and watch, um, you know, that kind of thing, socialising. But nowadays, I'm definitely more introverted. I don't. I don't really like socialising that much. To be honest, I can't stand people. To be honest. yeah. <laughs> uh, at the moment, I just can't understand what's going on at my own. But yeah, that's another another story. But yeah, I've got a circle of mates, but I don't tend to socialise that much. To be honest. Yeah. Yeah, I'm a bit similar. To be fair, um, I like logical people and stuff. But then, 
Yeah, there you go. Um, honesty. So this one was a big one for me whenever I <clears throat> sort of played football or coached or anything. Um, I, I struggle with it now. Um, I was telling you the other day, um, played five aside with my mates and ball went out for a, a kick in or a throw in. And one of them picked the ball up and held on to it um, just to waste a bit of time and let everyone get back in position. And for me, that's sort of cheating. That's how I see it. Um, but now it seems part of the game and it's it's clever or whatever. But there's a lot a lot of things around that, like not diving. Um, I remember way I remember I gave away a penalty once. Uh, I didn't even touch him. He just dived and it was a Sunday league pitch. It weren't you know professional football or anything. It was just a Sunday league game and he dived and. I couldn't let it go, it just really wound me up um, to the point where I wanted to break his legs basically just for him diving, so it's like, yeah, I struggle with that sort of side of it. I mean, what's, did you sort of struggle with that sort of side of it, the honesty side? Yeah, like I say, even with my kids now, uh, for instance, my little seven-year-old um, was training um, indoor the day at a sports centre. Um, and he got he got touched and he, he, he a little dive and I was like in me I was like what are you doing get up you know I was like what are you doing diving and obviously they see it on TV and stuff but it's just yeah I'm not the same I, I I can honestly say I don't think I ever really dived to get something you know um, but yeah it, it's the honesty thing like I couldn't it's something in me that, that um, if someone tackled me if I didn't feel like I was hurt I would stay on my feet you know probably the same as you but yeah. yeah, that's weird. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't just. I just if, if I'm hurt, I'm hurt. If I'm not, I'm gonna. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get up. I don't understand that nowadays. I'm always saying to the kids, if I see you diving, I'm just gonna bring you off. You know. So <laughs> I'm sort of pretty brutal like that. But yeah, can't stand it. Yeah, I mean, just on that as well. There's, there's, there's many other things. It's like claiming a corner. I mean, this it seems a little thing, but it's still up. If the ball goes out for a corner and you know it's, say if you're attacking, and you know it's not your ball, you know it's the opposition's, I feel uncomfortable still claiming, even though it's part and parcel of it, or you have to claim for it. Stuff like that, <laughs> I struggle with. Um, so, yeah, um, it's a big thing. It's a big thing. Um, if I'm watching United and we're 1 0 down or something, and, and it's a corner, it's not a corner. I'm thinking it's a corner, <laughs> it's a corner, yeah. But yeah, it's just I think it's if it's um, if it's happening specifically like on, on yourself, sort of thing, or yeah, it's hard to justify. Yeah, it's the honesty thing, I suppose, but yeah, I get where you're coming from, yeah. Um, so next bit navigating sort of illogical rules or policies, um, so yeah, a bit like the honesty thing, really. For the, get yellow carded for something they didn't even do that had, they might not let it go um, to the point where they could just get sent off potentially um, plans changing um, that could be an issue for, if they're used to you know intense routine and structure so if they change systems or move clubs you know fixtures get rearranged or something like that or training you know anything like that could throw them off potentially um, talking skills they may talk less if you've got like, anxiety as well. Um, they may not understand what they're meant to say. Um, meant should be in inverted fingers, really. I'm thinking about it now. But um, banter, they may not quite understand this or may take things literally. Uh, is there anything you want to add on any of those? Uh, yeah, no, I was fine with, with, with changing plans. Um, obviously, you know, time wise and stuff. Um, just being on time again, it's fine with that. I moved. I moved to a lot of clubs, so that wasn't a problem for me. Uh, banter, yeah, I, I, it wasn't a problem. I, I could have a, a lot of banter and stuff, but yeah, taking things literally. If someone says something to me, yeah, um, I suppose I was a little bit sensitive sometimes, and I, I would, I, I'd, you know, I had a bite in me as well, and I had a cut in bite. So a lot of people didn't really get on my bad side because they know I'd just come back with something really bad. Which I could do if yeah. I really wanted to. Um, <laughs> so about, yeah, but um, <coughs> talking skills. No, I was putting pretty fine on, on this sort of stuff, um, to be honest, that we just mentioned. Yeah, cool. Uh, next slide, please. So, a few more. Um, this top one you know, can apply to any sort of industry, but obviously, <coughs> we're talking about sports. 
um, you know, climbing the ladder, may not possess the social skills or what you could change that word social for another sort of thing. But yeah, um, so applying for a manager role, need to put an A in the manager bit there. Um, yeah, so they can struggle with getting promotions and moving up the, the world, whether it's corporate, you yeah, know, it depends what sort of role you're doing. Um, even if it's a manager, you might have got promoted to being a manager because, you know, I don't know, you don't do the banter thing, or you don't, I don't know, it could be anything like that which could prevent you from doing it. Um, anxiety, um, so performing in front of big crowds, that could be um, something to struggle with. The same with, you know, opposition fans um, or spectators. It could be even, could be Sunder League or, sat, you know, we're a kids team, parent, opposition parents sort of stood on the sidelines, could be anything like that. Um, challenging authority if they don't agree with them. Um, again, I think we touched on that earlier. Um, may only be able to play or perform a certain way. Um, I don't think you struggle with this, John, I think, but for me, I, I was just right-footed. I didn't use my left at all. Um, if it's other sports, you may sort of hold a racket the wrong way or what was the one hockey stick I struggled with. I always used to hold that wrong. I can't remember the right way you meant to do it now, but I used to do it wrong. Um, you know, it leads into sort of coordination. You could sort of run differently or struggling to, to time your jumping. I always struggled if the ball was in the air, playing football, the ball in the air for ages. I'd, I'd sort of, I don't know how to struggle. I'd get bored and then I'd, I'd get too anxious. I'd get a mixture of things about balls up in the air because I'm having to think about it and I'd struggle to then jump. And I think, right, I'm going to jump now. And just so I'm about to do it, someone else is jump in front of me. And I thought, oh, bloody hell. But yeah, you struggle that sort of side of it. But I don't know if you did, did you? Did you? Was you okay with all that? No, I was fine. Um, yeah. Mainly the anxiety that would be built up massively, obviously, on a different kind of scale. The pressure that I had to deal with, obviously, you know, overthinking stuff in my head. It wasn't just performing that I had to deal with. Obviously, it was the hidden, um, you know, being on the spectrum sort of thing. Yeah. That would cause me more damage because technically I, I was I was really good anyway, so that was fine. Yeah. It was it was it was a thinking of what what I, what I needed to do, what I'm going to do, who's looking at me, you know, what instructions have I got today, who am I marking, just overthinking stuff, and that that obviously that builds up anxiety, um, and it it can affect your sort of concentration. Obviously, like I, people always say, oh, you're you're lacking a bit of concentration, like concentrate. Well, I remember managers even team, make sure you're concentrating. I'm thinking. Who are, you, who are you talking to? Do you know yeah. what I mean? I'd be like in my head thinking, don't, you know, you don't understand what's going on in my head. The things I had to, I had to sort of do in my in my thought process before I even play a game. But I suppose that was my fault. I'd be really saved anyway. But yeah, the anxiety, you know, to go out and play for the seventy five thousand, uh, um, and all of the clubs who were like you know thirty five and forty thousand. It's like yeah, it's different things that I had to think about. Um, just building yourself up to, to perform to a level that, um, that's expected of you was quite, you know, was quite draining to be fair. Like obviously after the game, I'm, I'm not physically drained. I'm, ment- I'm more mentally drained than anything. Um, yeah. Because physically, I was, I was, I was, a, not to say I was a beast, but I was a big lad. I was strong anyway. I, I was fast and stuff. But yeah, it's more the mental side that was sort of that can damage you. Yeah, definitely. Um. Next slide, please. Keep saying please again, don't mean to. Right, so we're just going to move on to neurodiversity. Um, I said I'm going to cover all the neurodiversity conditions in the coming days in a bit more detail. Um, <clears throat> some of you may not have heard of this term, depending on what your, your knowledge is of autism, etc. Um, it's still, it's not a new word as such, but it is in people's you know, knowledge of it. Um, so it describes variations in the human brain and how it's wired differently. So it includes how people interact socially, how they learn, retention skills, mood regulation, uh, and other mental functions as well. Um, you know, there's there's much debate as to which exact conditions make up neurodiversity. Um, for example, OCD is an anxiety disorder, uh, and therefore not a neurodiverse condition. But others will disagree with that. And you know that's fine. Um, however, it's commonly accepted that it includes autism, but it definitely includes autism, ADHD, dyslexia, and dyspraxia. 
Um, <clears throat> then others include Discalculate and Dysgraphia as well. Um, the lifelong do not go away, people do not, do not grow out of them, whereas with mental health problems you can, some of them can come and go, so that's one of the differences there. Um, next slide. Um, so I've said people often confuse neurodiversity with mental health condition. Um, again, you can have both, which you, know, you can have. A, you can be autistic, you can have anxiety, for example. And that's where confusion can occur. There, um, a key difference is that the mental health conditions fluctuate over time. I've just said that. Um, now, the term neurodiversity was created in 1998 by. Australian sociologist Judy Singer. Um, there's much, I touched on this earlier, there's much debate as to whether neurodiversity is a dis disability or not. Um, <clears throat> so, for example, as I've said, autistic people, some believe it's a disability, many do not. Um, I think it's similar with ADHD as well. Um, but, for example, the main class dyslexia or dyspraxia is a disability. You know, some wouldn't, but some would, so that's where it can get <coughs> a bit confusing for people. Um, next slide. <coughs> oh, is that the end of it? Didn't realise we got there that quick. <laughs> My bad. Um, so, that's the end, um, well, coming towards the end of today. Uh, so my camera's still flickering. I'll turn that off again. Apologies for that. Yeah, so I hope you've learned a little bit about sort of autism today, how it you know, relates to the sports industry. So this is mainly for the sports sector, this particular, um, these particular sessions, um, you know, strengths you can have with autism, struggles you can have as well, um, different variations of how these strengths and struggles may manifest as well. Um, so just for, I'll just get some comments from John as well. Um, I say tomorrow we're going to look at um, the other neurodiverse conditions, how they work as well, how they have similarities to autism, but massive differences as well. Um, is there anything you want to add, John? So any sort of you know things we've discussed, or anything else you want to add on autism, or about your personal experience, you know, your playing experience, etc. Um, I suppose we could go into more detail on it, on it all, really, to be honest. But um, no, I was quite happy today. Just a light sort of overview. Um, so we didn't go into too much detail. But um, no, it's just soaking it all up. I say I'm, I'm still learning myself, like I told you before. So it's um, some of the some of the terms that you come out some, some of them I've not even heard. You know, um, you know like the, even you know, the OCD as well. I know um, Beckham. I think well, he's, he's doing a, a documentary soon on Netflix. Uh, it's not been announced yet, but obviously, um, but yeah, even he's um, he's on the spectrum as well, um, bombshell. But yeah, he, um, he I could see the obviously I room with him for for three about three four years, and I, I could see something in him as well um, with the OCD. Um, I want everything so perfect, but yeah, just um, with, with my condition as well. I say, yeah, I'm still learning. Like I say, I suppose you are as well, you know, you know, but um I say talking about it obviously helps, don't it? So yeah, um we'll we'll crack on this week and um we'll get to the bottom, you know, we can discuss some stuff, can't we? Yeah, definitely. And look like so many is I could speak for hours about autism, there's so much things you can bring up, you can't just do it in you know in a in an hour slot. Um and like I say you learn every, you learn something every day. I know it sounds corny or whatever but you really do in terms of autism well there's, there's lots of things you keep picking up on a daily basis you think oh I, I do that or that's related to autism that's related to whatever it is um, mm -hmm. so yeah there's lots there um, right we'll sign off then um, I've just got to end this call let me just do that right so thank, thanks everyone for coming um, I'm going to stop the live in a second um, so yeah, I hope to see you for day two, um, same time tomorrow, so it'll be 10 a.m., um, the same for Wednesday, um, Thursday as well. Uh, we'll let you know about Friday, Saturday, Sunday, the times, because they may change, but Monday to Thursday, it's going to be 10 a.m. every day, 
Um, just join the same way you have done today. Hopefully everyone's got in. If you're catching this on YouTube, uh, hello. You're watching it behind, but I hope you found something valuable. And also if you're watching it in the group, in the Facebook group later on today or tomorrow, uh, I hope you found it valuable as well. Right, so thanks John for today. Thanks from the team as well. And I will end this now. So thank you everyone. Okay, see you later.